for the lost brother that Elizabeth Clefane wrote about. You probably never heard the name Elizabeth Clefane, but she's the one who wrote that song that David sang, the 99. And she had a brother by the name of George, who was what they called a remittance man. That's a dubious distinction because remittance man was uh, a term that was used mostly in the 19th century, and it described men who were ill-behaved children of wealthy English families, mostly the royalty. And these uh, remittance men would uh, agree to leave England and never come back. George was one of them. And in return for their compliance, the rogue royalty person would receive either a lump sum or a monthly remittance. They would get the check in the mail every single month just to stay away from merry old England. Don't come and embarrass this family any longer was the message. And George was no different. He was 23 years of age. His alcoholism was out of control and his family just absolutely gave up on him. And they sent him to Canada, away from England, all the way to Canada in 1842, where he became a very unsuccessful farmer. He had 60 acres that produced almost nothing. His only memorable success was the ability to consume large amounts of cheap whiskey. Written off as hopeless by friends and family and farming, to say the least, George Clefane made a mess of his life. It's probably the understatement of the world. The news never reported the actual reason for his death, but most people thought that it was an end to his life due to a drunken stupor. It seems that his horse could not bear to have him on his back, threw him, and a few days after he hit the ground and uh, he died from the injuries. You and I probably would never have heard of George Clefane if every member of his family had actually given up on him. But there was one, and her name was Elizabeth. She was 12 years younger than George, and she loved her big brother. And within a few days, with she being in England and him being in Canada, it took a while for the news to, came back, to come back, a month or so, but within a few days of hearing of his death in 1851, she wrote the poem, The Ninety and Nine, in memory of the kind of one that Jesus would leave 99 safe in the fold in order to go find. You can just hear the pathos in that hymn. If you ever get a chance to look it up, it's in the old Broadman hymn note that uh, we have around here somewhere. Uh, you can find that online. If you just look at the words very carefully and meditate on them a little bit, you can hear the pathos of the younger sister Elizabeth Clefane describing George in the third stanza of that poem. She described him as sick and helpless and ready to die. Indeed, if Jesus got through to George Clefane on his deathbed, and nobody really knows whether that happened or not, but surely with George's resume of failure and disappointment and disgrace, the last stanza of that poem tells us that the rejoicing in heaven over that one lost sheep coming home would have been a thunderous chorus of angels singing the likes of which we have never heard. Now, that is the story behind the hymn that David sang. What do we make of the gospel that inspired that story, that inspired Elizabeth Clefane to write the 99? Well, there are the facts of the gospel, and you can get them by just reading, which is what we did earlier. Those are the facts of the gospel. They were 90 and 9, they were safe, they were in the fold. The fact is that the Savior left the 99 safe in the fold, probably had some other shepherds there to make sure they didn't get out, probably made sure that they were fine. But he left the company and the fellowship of the 99 good sheep to look for that one lost black sheep. There's the facts of the gospel, and then there's the deep meaning of the gospel, meaning of the facts. 
One of those meanings is that Jesus always seeks the lost, the least, and the last. He's always looking for that one who's lost. You remember what he said to the Pharisee? You know, a well person has no need of a physician. <clears throat> the physician goes to the sick. You know, the undertaker doesn't need to talk to the living. He needs to minister to the dead. In the Gospel account, the Pharisees represent the ones that Jesus really needed to go to because they represent the lost coin, they represent the lost sheep, they represent the lost son. They're the ones who are grumpy over the company that Jesus is keeping. What kind of company did Jesus keep? Prostitutes, tax collectors, drunks, gluttons, all sorts of seedy sinners. And in the debate that Jesus had in the 15th chapter of the Gospel of Luke and other where in the Gospels, as we find the war between light and evil, between good and evil, between darkness and light, the war rages on. And in the debate with Jesus and the Pharisees, he tells them how the woman who lost her coin had to look for that coin where? In the well-lighted places, in the good places, in the places where it was supposed to be? No. She had to go look in the dark and dusty corners of the house. She had to look every place that the coin should not have been. Jesus tells them how the shepherd had to search for the lost sheep. Not in the pen where they should be. Not at the side where it would be better for them to be. But out among the rocks, the rocky, lonely places. And he tells them how the father, where the lost son is concerned, had to wait patiently for the lost son to make his way home. The meaning of the facts here is that you will not find those who need to hear the good news inside the temple on Sunday morning at 11 o'clock. We like to think so. <laughs> to seek and to save those who are lost means you're willing to go out and find them where they hang out. You look for a coin in the most unexpected place. You look for a lost sheep in the hard places. Too many churches that have spider webs on the pews where there ought to be joyful worshiping Christians thought that hanging a sign out on the front lawn that says y'all come is sufficient. I mean, after all, don't those people in the community know where we are? They want to worship, they come here. You know, Jesus didn't do it that way. And I wonder where we got the idea that it's done that way. The deeper meaning of the gospel message, the facts of the gospel, that the shepherd left the 99 and went to seek for the lost one is that that's our job too, is to go and to seek the lost one. What do they look like? We'll get into that in just a second. Another fact that you find is loving, loving the lost, the least, and the last. Now, it's pretty easy to love sheep. I mean, they are incredibly cute, are they not? I mean, sheep are just sweet to look at. But they are also stinky, aren't they? And they're also pretty stupid. They also have a, a habit of wandering away. That song that we sing, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. That's because we're sheep. We are the sheep that Jesus is talking about. Frankly, I'm not sure that there's a shepherd of sheep that enjoys the problems that are associated with difficult animals. I don't know if you care for animals on a regular basis, but it is a 24-7, 365 job and more. Just ask the parents of a, of a paralyzed Shih Tzu dog. I mean, if a little animal that small can cause that much of a problem and take up that much of our time, imagine what it's like to have a flock of wanderers like that. No accident, Scripture calls people who belong to God sheep, because like sheep, we've all gone astray. Some of us, like sheep, have left home uh, being stubborn about coming back. There needs to be, some, there must be some good grazing out there. Remember why the prodigal left home? He went to the foreign land. We heard about those parties. Must have been New Orleans that they were talking about. Yeah, they heard about all those parties out there. He had to leave. Maybe like a prideful, ungrateful prodigal, we left home. Maybe we got lost like a coin. Didn't intend to, but it just happened. How do you know where to find a sheep 
wandering from God's purposes and plans? I mean, if, if our job is not here at 11 a.m. or 9.30 in the morning on a Sunday morning, if our job is really out there seeking the last, the least, and the lost, then how do you recognize them and where do you go to find them? Well, in order to do that, just, uh, just pull out the list of the seven deadly sins and you'll see what they look like. What are the seven deadly sins? Greed. Do you know any greedy people? They have no room in their life for church or for God simply because they're too busy with their greed. What about sloth or laziness? What about lust? What about gluttony? What about pride? What about wrath or anger? And what about envy? There's a list of the seven deadly sins. You start to put faces on those seven deadly sins, you will not, never ask the question again, where do I find them? Folks, it's like my good friend Sam Ruth over in Randleman said to me one time, he said, there's a lot of Ruths in Randolph County. He said, you cannot sling a dead cat without hitting a Ruth somewhere. And you know what? I, 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 I think it's that way with the last, the least, and the lost. All you have to do is take a look at our culture today, and you know that it's not 99 and 1 anymore. It may be just the other way around. There may be that many that have fled the pen, the sheep pen, the fold, if you will. You start putting the list of the seven deadly sins on some faces that you know. Your dance card, learning to love and care for wandering sheep, is going to keep you engaged like somebody who's trying to herd house cats. They never appreciate your efforts. But your job as one of God's under-shepherds is to seek them, not to please them, but to seek them for the sake of the Savior. And that leads us to the final thought really here about seeking. The facts of the gospel have the woman turning her house upside down looking for that coin. She is frantic to find that coin. And what's happening in that house? As she is seeking for that coin, she's got a broom out, and she's throwing dust everywhere, and it's flying all over the place. Dark places are being searched with a, as much of a floodlight as she can turn on. And she will not rest until that coin is found. Now that's a fact of the gospel. God never rests until he finds that lost coin, that lost sheep. The shepherd is off in the wilderness. He's climbing over rocks and crags. He's not in the church house on Sunday morning at 11 o'clock for the purpose of finding the lost sheep. No, he would be here to worship. But he's not here to find the lost sheep. 99% of the people I speak to every Sunday morning, whether it's here or on the internet, 99% are already in the fold. They're the 99. Maybe 1% wanders in from time to time. No, the seeking is done outside those doors. The shepherd is off in the wilderness. He's climbing over rocks and crags and He's fording streams. He's fighting off mountain lions and bears. And he's listening closely all the time for the sound of a lonely, bleating lamb caught in a thicket somewhere. And he will not quit until he finds a live animal to bring home or the remains of an ear or a hoof to prove that the animal is forever lost. And if a sheep is still stubborn, tending to run off every chance it gets. Shepherds have been known to take the leg of a sheep and break it. Just like that. Bare hands just break the leg of the sheep. Why would the shepherd do that? Have you ever felt like God did that to you? Did you ever feel like you were taken to the woodshed and you came out limping? Think about Jacob. You remember Jacob at the river Jabbok? You remember he lived for the rest of his life after that? That's a, uh, a symbol. It, it, it's an analogy, really, of what God does with us sometimes. If we're prideful and we refuse to come back home, if we refuse to stop wandering, sometimes God does do that. But listen, in Israel and every part of that world where shepherds understand this and do break a leg from time to time, 
During the healing process of that leg mending back together, that lamb can't walk. That sheep cannot follow the rest of the herd. So how does that sheep come along? You've seen the picture, haven't you, of Jesus with the lamb on his shoulders and holding both of the feet? That's where that picture comes from. The fact is that the shepherd would pick up that sheep with a broken leg, the leg that he has broken, so that that sheep won't wander anymore. And he will carry that lamb until that lamb is able to walk again. And the bond that develops between the shepherd and the sheep during times like that. Listen, I'm not giving you a history lesson that I read in a book somewhere. I'm telling you what God did to wrestle. God broke me at a time when I should have been listening to him the most. It was shortly before we made the decision to go into ministry. God was making that decision for me. He broke my leg. He broke my spirit inside he got to me because he knew what he wanted me to do with this, with my life. And I was a wandering prodigal. The father of the prodigal will stand by the fence every single day until that son is keen, seen in the distance coming home. And then you know what the father does? What did he do in the prodigal son parable? The father was waiting and as soon as he saw the son, it says at a great distance, he dropped whatever he was doing and he ran to that son. And he fell on his neck in an embrace and he showered his neck with kisses. Welcome home. I think about my father and myself coming home from Vietnam. I'd been away a year in the war zone. And I came home. I was so glad to see my family. I hugged my bride. My father, who was not a hugger in those days, turned out he learned how to do that really well. Well, I tell you what, he hugged everything he saw in his later years. But in my early years, 20 years old, returning from a war zone, the airport, my father, like the father of the prodigal, fell on my neck. And to the best of my recollection, my father, who had never before kissed me, would not stop kissing my neck. Just like the father of the prodigal. The fact the gospel are also the deep meaning of the gospel. Like it was one stormy night on the Sea of Galilee when Jesus walked on the water to get to the worried disciples on the boat. You know what the fact or the meaning of the facts of the gospel really are? Jesus will do whatever has to be done to get to his own. Even if it's walking on water, even if it's letting somebody pull the roof back and let a lame man down, even if it's raising you when the doctors have said you're already dead and they've signed the death warrant. Jesus will do whatever is necessary to get to his own. How do I know that? Because he came for me. He came for you, didn't he? Doesn't the 99 describe not us, but that one who was lost? Anybody, anybody here who wasn't lost before they came to Jesus? As we close our service this morning, I tell you that Elizabeth Clefane wrote at least seven other poems of which the words were set to him tunes. One of those is a favorite of mine, and it's in our hymnal. It's uh, Beneath the Cross of Jesus. This hymn stands as a guide for what to do if in your heart you sense that you're one of those sheep for whom Jesus is seeking or needs to seek. It tells you where to take your stand. The first stanza goes something like this. Beneath the cross of Jesus, I fain would take my stand. I would choose to take my stand beneath the cross of Jesus. It tells you how to see the suffering Savior on the cross as one who died for you. And it tells you where it will lead you to rest in your soul. Boy, that, that term peace in our soul. Isn't that the greatest phrase in the English language? Peace in my soul. It's all there beneath the cross of Jesus. Let's pray together. Father God, for any of us who have come to the point of truly surrendering our will and our life to you, we understand what the author, Elizabeth Clefane, knew 
was the condition of her brother's soul, sick and helpless and ready to die. And Lord, a soul apart from you is all of that, sick and helpless and ready to die. Lord, help us be ready to really live. Help us to embrace your loving embrace. Let us not be satisfied to be a lost coin hiding in our 401k protected from the offering plate. Help us be wide awake like a prodigal finally realizing what a pig pen smells like. Help us to swallow pride and come home and take our stand beneath the cross of Jesus. And Lord, for those of us who have already been there, help us to help others. Plant the seed of seeking in our hearts and our bones that we might be like Jesus, ready to hang out with those who need some good news. For the glory, the honor, and the praise to which you alone are worthy, O Lord, we pray in the name of the Son, cooperating with the Spirit to honor and exalt the majesty of the Father. Let it be so in each of our lives. Amen. Pastor, before you close the service, I'd like to remember Eddie Lambert's wife. She has cancer. Jerry said to put a feed and tube in this slick door, and she just weighs 70 pounds, and she's going to have to go three or four more times this week, and I'll let you remember in prayer. Amen. We remember her, and Jesus is on the job. I forgot to say it this morning because we just asked him for prayer. But I was just thinking of it when you said one more and I have to thank of her. We're going to sing two songs actually. 297 is the hymn Beneath the Cross of Jesus. We'll sing that song and uh, we'll have a brief prayer of uh, blessing and dismissal and then we're, we're going to sing a song about this little light that we've got. Uh, you may not have sung that song since you were a little one in vacation Bible school, but you know the words, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. <clears throat> That's so we can go out of here carrying light. Because where is the job? Not here on 938 in the morning on a Sunday. Where is our job beginning? Out there, seeking the last, the least, 